I guess before the actual presentation begins, I'm just curious to get a feel of the room on how many of you are studying computer science? Okay, maybe like 5%, 10%. How many of you are studying physics? All right, and then what did like what what are the other majors here? Or undecided maybe? Yeah. First year. That's cool. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm a the master's student in the electrical and computer engineering program. Oh, hardware. Got it. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Applied math. Nice. Okay, cool. Um this will be a little artsy. It'll be a little sciencey. Um, it's supposed to be an introduction. So like I assume no real prerequisite knowledge to quantum, but I do want to bring you from the point of here's like what a classic quantum 101 looks like to what are things that we're actually using in industry, like parameterized circuits. How do you pick right parameters and all that stuff? And so you should be an example like an interact sensor right now because basically for any your question you're gonna get it i got about like 10 of them Ooh, so yeah. Yeah. any question interrupt any time and you're gonna get it ready. and then whatever it is like, please teacher well we figure something out yeah feel free to uh interrupt me and everything i'm i'm happy with that uh the original presentation i gave had wine but i can't give you guys wine so <laughs> just imagine you're sipping on a nice glass uh, welcome to Quantum cu Cuisine. Uh, ignore the last part of that last sentence, but it is an exclusive culinary experience minus the uh, culinary and wine. Um, so for an appetizer, we're going to go over some quantum terminology just so we can speak more freely and you guys' questions can, you know, make, make more sense. Um, qubits. So what is it? How are they controlled? There are a bunch of different technologies you heard about in the, uh, the keynote. Um, the three kind of important ones I want to focus on are superconducting. They're, you know, the first cloud-based quantum computer was IBM superconducting qubit, quantum cloud. Um, and then we have their, uh, like, they have this Josephson junction that has interesting quantum properties when you have uh, magnetic and electromagnetic fields around it. They're incredibly fast. They're controlled with microwave pulses, which are high energy and incredibly fast. Um, but they decohere quickly because they're manufactured qubits. And then we have trapped ions, which is what ion Q uses, and Quantinuum and a few other companies. And they're tr like trapped ions that we use kind of this saddle-like electromagnetic field to keep these little atoms from rolling off of either way. We trap them along this line and uh, we shoot lasers at them. Similarly to the microwaves, except they're lower energy lasers, the computations take a little bit longer to run. And then something like topological, which Amazon is researching, I think Microsoft too, super interesting qubits that have error correcting components in their own structure. The molecular structure has error correcting, like, or, or I guess it may be error mitigating properties, which is very neat, but we don't really have any of them in any sort of commercial sense. So um, at least it's worth thinking about it uh, in, in a couple of years, it might be cool. So, a lot of you have probably heard about quantum mechanics and the two real interesting properties we're going to use is superposition and entanglement. Superposition is like you flip a quarter, it's spinning in the air. You don't exactly know what it is, but uh, you can still like, I guess, shoot it with a laser and it'll do something to the spin. Um, <laughs> and I don't know a great way to explain that, but um, basically it's like the cool earth analogy where you're standing on earth, your coordinates are defined by like, a vector of like two, um, like two degrees, and um, and superposition is just like how much of each degree is our qubit in, and the actual, I guess in our trapped ion, uh, example, the actual like definition of of how much of what something is is um, in state preparation for trapped ion we flash everything, make them all like state zero, whatever that means, lowest energy state. So we get all the photons out. We make sure that the like photon that or the electron that's orbiting the ion is in its lowest energy state via some specific frequency that we know will uh, resonate with the atom. If it resonates a certain way, we can release all the energy. Then we can cool them with lasers. And when that's done, if we want to actually put a qubit in a specific state, um, we do uh, we we create specific pulses that will 
jostle the uh, valence electron into some state between zero and one. And what you do is you adjust the amplitude of your laser such that um, there is like 30% chance that qubit's valence electron went into uh, the first excited state, right? So you can adjust your amplitude and a bunch of other little things that you have to tweak because um, you know it's more complicated than that. But you basically can adjust this pulse to put any sort of qubit in any arbitrary superposition. And then entanglement is very interesting because with trapped ions, we have all-to-all -all connectivity, which means if you have a source of photons and you can split those photons into two um, like kind of rays, you can entangle any uh, any ion that's part of the chain. And they, as long as the lasers have the resonant frequency, you can ensure that these two ions that get kind of struck and uh, create like a, a sort of mo movement mode to them, right? They have some sort of um, bouncing action because the ions are all like magnetically held and captured. There is magnetic movement transferred to other atoms in the chain, other ions in the chain, such that um, you can entangle two qubits and the entire chain will like continue following along the same like quantum evolution. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, for the software side, we have a qubit. That's the quantum bit. Makes sense. A quantum gate is what I'm going to call like that laser pulse. If we want to flip a valence electron from the zero state to the first energy level, that would be like an X gate. If we want to bring it back down, that'd be another X gate because they're all reversible. The quantum state is like, what state are we currently in? So these block spheres are useful to seeing, like to visualize the current state. They're useful for learning, but for actual application, we don't really use them that much. But you can see that we have some superposition between zero and one. And there's also a bit of movement here, which is like kind of the phase of the qubit. So qubits that like ion Q use, for example, are ions evolve with time. They have a certain wavelength that's attributed. And over time, that wavelength, you know, if this is, it, it kind of is, is changing along, uh, the phase is changing, you know? So um, when you apply a pulse, any sort of, uh, any sort of gate, right? You're going to have a movement that follows kind of the phase of the qubit. Uh, for measurement, we obviously just shine a laser across all the qubits and they resonate. And that's great because now you can, if you see a photon, right? So if, if we have a one being the excited state and a zero being the relaxed state, you shine some resonant laser. If the valence electron falls down to the uh, first state, non-excited state, uh, you have to preserve energy. So a photon will fly out of that atom and we read the photon when the state one collapses. And that's our way of like knowing, hey, it was a one. You measure that a bunch of times, you can get a distribution that gives you an answer. Block sphere is this little thing. Quantum circuit is this. So we combine a bunch of gates together and we show them on like these wires. And these wires are useful because you can even show like a quantum algorithm and you can start seeing patterns in algorithms. Like uh, you can, I mean, Troy's algorithm is very complicated, but the actual like like VQE has a very, very simple pattern to it that you can look at nicely with the, the quantum circuit. So to get started, I want to show a simple quantum circuit. Um, and I want to kind of walk through with you guys how to, um, I guess, let, let me think. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Is that good for you guys? Is that legible, maybe? Okay, cool. So um, for your guys' work today, or for the hackathon, I assume many of you are using Hiskit. And um, I can share the link to this GitHub afterwards if you want like a little bit of a getting started. Um, we're basically just importing the quantum circuit and the simulator. Those are the most important things we're doing. And hopefully it all installs nicely. Let's find out. Okay, good. That took a long time. Um, and then for air, Kiskit Air is like their simulator and we can get the air simulator backend. Um, it's not a state vector simulator. There are two different things. So let's just set some seeds to make it reproducible. This is kind of the only important part you would need to worry about. Um, and what we can first do is create a quantum circuit that is nothing. And all qubits are usually initialized to state zero. So in the block sphere, that's why you see it's pointed to state zero. And we can show the 
um, the actual like matrix that defines this circuit. And we can see it's just an identity matrix. It's just one, zero, zero, one. Um, but what we can also do is we can apply a gate to it. So I created this HOP gate and th there are easier ways to do this. So you could do um, circuit dot H. <laughs> so that would be the same thing. But um, I wanted to show that you that that these gates, right? The Hadamard gate in this case, they're just made up of these matrices, right? And they have to be a unitary matrix, matrix um, which means that they're reversible. So let's apply an H gate and let's see what happens. Oh, cool, we have superposition. So now we are equally likely to measure zero and equally likely to measure one. That's what this is saying, right? And you can imagine it's like a broom that falls over and you don't exactly know it's gonna fall over, but if you put a broom like this, you're pretty likely that the brooms is gonna fall down that way. So it's, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then we can see the state of this circuit. If we apply another H gate, this becomes like the reproducibility of the circuit. Every every gate needs to be reversible. And that actually gets into um, like the challenge that we're going to announce is it's very important that these gates are reproducible. And what we can also do is add some more fancy things. We can give another T an H gate and we can apply some phase. So like the T gate applies as a phase rotation, right? To so you can see that the arrow now moves as moves with phase and this in our quantum computers is represented as time. So we literally just wait like a couple milliseconds and boom, we're good. Um, and then we can finally actually do some, uh, we can apply a measurement gate. We can apply an X gate. We just move now again um, and let's measure. So when you measure a quantum circuit, it's not useful to give like one measurement. It's useful to measure like a hundred times or a thousand. And in real applications, you have to measure like 10,000 times because you're using so many circuits and the circuits are so deep that it's not useful to even measure a hundred times. You have to like get a distribution of like 10,000 shots. In this case, we can see that um, the qubit is between state zero and one, and we can see a relatively equal measurement between zero and one. But we can't at all measure the phase here. Right. There's no way to tell that this arrow wasn't pointed, you know, backwards or right here where it started. Um, and that's one of the like you can't measure the quantum state. Right. You just get one number that comes out of this quantum circuit and um, you could you could flip, which is called like measuring in different bases. You can measure in a different basis and get the phase out of here. But um, in most cases, phase is hidden. Right. So all you can do is see unless you change the base of state. Of measurement, you can just kind of see that, hey, we got a 50-50 distribution between zero and one. Now to get into more useful like concepts that we actually use, and that's uh, like parameters. So oftentimes we will use kind of these parameters to uh, have a circuit that, let's see, let me get to the fun part. So what we can do is we can entangle these circuits. So we could put qubit zero in a superposition state and we can use CX gates to entangle, right, the all of the qubits together. We can apply phase rotation, or we can apply a bunch of different rotations um, using these parameters, parameterized gates. And in the um, in the in the GitHub link, if you guys want to like just kind of as a refresher, it has a bunch of stuff. Um, you can rotate by X, Y, and Z via different angles. So um, that's what this is doing. It's just applying different rotations, and then we undo, right? So this is the inverse of this first part. We can actually undo um, the gate, the gates at the end. And what we'll see is just kind of this parameters. Um, so let's see, what can we do? We can assign just some randomized uh, values to the parameters. And when we measure, we can kind of see some sort of distribution and we use parameterized circuits a lot in something that's called like an onsatz. How, how am I doing on time? I'm curious. Okay, cool. So now to get into something a little bit more useful, something that we use parameterized circuits with a lot, and this is hybrid like quantum classical classif quantum classical classifiers. Um, and in this case, what we can do is let's just set up some stuff. Doesn't really matter. Um, we can use this. Onzots thing that's like a ZZ feature map 
and uh, it's a parameterized circuit. And we can literally throw in a quantum circuit as a layer of a neural network. So here we can have a linear classical, like three bits you start with. You're going to push it to two bits. And those two bits will be encoded in a quantum circuit that I'll show you. Um, do I show you? Yeah. So those two bits are going to be encoded in each of these qubits. And then finally, um, our qubit, our circuit gets run. These parameters get updated. And we can, we can put those quantum bits back into a, um, where is it? Sorry. <laughs> we can put those quantum bits back into a, um, into the last layer and finally have an output for a classifier of good or bad. It's very small because, um, they, they kind of take a long time to run, but, um, let's see if we can show some of the training here. A lot of this is just boilerplate stuff, but, um, this is the important part is seeing what our quantum neural network looks like. We have linear input. We have some quantum layer in between, and then we have some output. And um, when we start training, so if you were to just do a classical version of this like training, right, it would be over in a second. It'd be done. It'd be so quick. But um, quantum computers are really slow and quantum simulation is also slow. So uh, that's why here it's going to take, I don't know, like two minutes to run. Um, so I don't, we don't have to exactly wait for it because I've already ran it before. But the interesting thing about using a quantum layer is you can actually, um, because you only need two qubits that can represent, you know, eight states, you can encode more information into only two bits that you have available. So two qubits can encode simultaneously eight bits of information. Um, thank you. Oh yeah, of course. Yes, this is local simulator. Um, if I were to use like the hardware, it would take quite a while, I think. Um, I guess I can show quickly if you do want to use, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about my slides. Parameterized, quantum optimized. Okay, yeah, so so we're here, there. <laughs> um, you can use quantum hardware by, if you want to use ion Q's stuff, um, you can go to cloud.ionq.com and make an account, um, which I think is pretty simple. And then if you go to API keys, you can um, you can create an API key. But I believe this only gives you simulator access. Yeah. Um, yeah. Free simulator access. But uh, yeah, so if and if you do want to run on hardware, I'm sure you could probably talk to one of us and we might be able to hook you up with something. But um, I, I don't know. So, you know. <laughs> Anyways, we're almost done with training. I'll skip ahead. Another internet, and this is, I guess, what we heard during the keynote was so much more like application has to happen with quantum computers. So even here, if you were to train a classical layer instead of the quantum layer, the decision boundary is a lot sharper. Um, and then with quantum, like I haven't even looked into it, but it's interesting that you can see a bunch of different characteristics coming out if you just use like bits and pieces as like a quantum circuit instead. And more of this research has to happen, I think. Um, this is just like a toy example, but I hope that like the concepts here, maybe some of you even the code of getting state preparation, if you wanted to do a QML application, you could use this like class if you wanted, just anything. Um, I think like the open sourceness is really important that we share our work, that we share our results. And um, I hope this was a good introduction for you guys. And I'm gonna hand it off to Vadim now to talk more about like the ion Q specific stuff. Yeah. Um, so I know you yeah. Um, so like, I heard that there's like a lot of them. Yeah. So what do they do essentially? Yeah. So um, I think we have Daiwei here who's like QML expert. You probably answer better than me. I, uh, Daiwei, you want to take over like the why different on yeah, structures are important? Do you, do you want to explain a little bit for a second why like different structures of onzots are better than other onzots? Because I couldn't give a great answer on that, honestly. Sure. Uh, usually, I think, I think the bottom line is it's just a conversation. So normally, uh, I guess, you will result if you measure you get a picture. Um, you have a party program, and if you answer, 
uh, the random distributions that Microsoft will give you is more close to that distribution you want, you will have an easier time getting mm -hmm. that one consideration. And that usually people will keep successful, I guess, guide will be mine according to your knowledge, nature of the problem itself. Like, for example, if I'm solving a physics Hamiltonian, that I know the Hamiltonian has a certain structure. And QLA is one example, you can see it that structure is next to it. And another consideration typically for this, you know, you have this universal, just like plus and EMS, but you know the fundamentals of this. The basic fact of being trusted is the universal plus and EMS fact. So we want to make an answer to say, if you don't know what's the state that the solution is in, kind of want something universal that. And with all this universal construction, typically one would feel like then, well, you have a very efficient construction that you can implement in the hardware. So these two together is usually what we take into consideration when designing the concept. And actually, you know, because of quantum advantage, usually to solve problems, it's really hard to know what's the underlying structure. So most of the time, kind of not getting too much information because of the nature of the problem, unless the proposed formulation is interesting, but you mostly rely on the understanding of which concept is more natively implement or be efficient. Cool, thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So to what extent, like if at all, could you say the lasers replace no bacon? Oh I don't I don't think it exactly replaces the doping. Um, can you, can you can you explain a little bit too, like what you mean by the question? Oh, I mean, like just like because you're saying it, you know, you're, it sounds like you get an example excess excitation. Yeah. States like like did the laser at all like did that change like the behavior of like it's you know semiconductors in the traditional sense like you know you have like doping materials. Um, hmm. like influence, you know, like influence things, and then versus trapped ion with our lasers, and then kind of how a superconducting qubit would be would be manipulated differently. Yeah. yeah, um, I think that we have like a lot of stability with how we do our state preparation, um, and like the coherence time, both T one T two are like quite long. But it's not, it's not like the whole story, right? It's also how many gates can you fit in that period of coherence. Um, with I think the biggest difference, obviously, would be a superconducting qubit has to be directly next to another superconducting qubit to be entangled, and like that different quality is probably the most beneficial for trapped ion, where you can connect, you can entangle any, because of the hardware constraints. Um, Maybe that's the best way I could answer. Okay. Yeah. So I hope I don't know if that was useful or not. Cool. And then Badi, take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Um we actually had different plans kind of depending on type of questions you guys are gonna have. Uh so I can uh go a little bit more into physics, what's actually happening, right? When we interact with lasers, uh we're gonna operate uh, with lasers on our ions, or I can actually uh, show you where you can find more resources, programming resources. So the best way to actually see the examples of using IonQ platform is to go to IonQ, uh, look for resources right here. Oops, I apologize. Here we go, resources. Uh, so under the resources, it's basically the uh, list of contents in resource center uh, where you can find, depending on what you want, uh, different courses, videos, depending on what material you prefer. Um, I would probably recommend just to look for getting started with Qiskit, for example, right? That's a really good starting point. Uh, if you already familiar with this Qiskit or if you don't know anything about the programming, I guess Qiskit is the most popular quantum programming language at this point. So probably going to be a good choice. Or if you prefer something a little bit more modern, Circ is going to be your second alternative. Uh, we have, and that's the code samples, which you can basically run using our simulator or run your local simulator. Uh, but in our case, we just uh, show you how to use Harmony, one of all the computers. To get access to real hardware, uh, we're basically uh, partnering with 
three major cloud providers. So Azure, AWS, GCP, you can easily, um, if you already have account, let's say university account with AWS, what you can do uh, if uh, it's set up all properly, you can simply create uh, or kind of request the access to, let's say, um, Amazon Bracket, right? And then use simple connectors to utilize uh, Harmony devices. And it's all explained there. I actually got a little bit of that in the slides. But yes, uh, I would say uh, compute kind of INQ resources and then go to resource center is going to be the best place to start initial documentation or kind of code samples. Plus, uh, if you want, uh, you can search for uh, INQ samples. We have the whole uh, GitHub repo where you can get the code with explanation what it actually doing. So let me quickly go back to my slides and start presenting. Okay, so a little bit kind of a repetition of uh, what, what Spencer was explaining. I actually want to talk a little bit more about hardware, kind of how it's implemented and what is the kind of difference, let's say, with superconducting implementation, right? And that's why we transition then to the native gates. It's not your full set kind of classical gates with Hadamards, right? We actually have only three physical operations, so physical gates and one virtual one, but I'm gonna get to that. And the techniques we are currently using, uh, which is not error correction, but error mitigation which helps to address a lot of, well, noise. Uh, we call it debicing and sharpening. It's a technique uh, which can be enabled on pretty much all of our QPUs, and it will help you to address the problems where, yeah, you have, let's say, under rotation, right? But then with uh, symmetric variance, you're going to be compensated toward, toward this under rotation. And after that yeah, Q&A session, uh, I think I can leave like probably 15 minutes for Q&A and whatever other questions you have, we can address those. So INQ Trapped Irons Hardware, it's the whole chamber where we keep those trapped irons and we use Euterbium. It's actually that big. It's pretty small, but then you have all that additional equipment around it. We need to have very stable, uh, electric voltage, right? Just to kind of have everything without introducing any noise to the system. We have the whole kind of laser, right? The whole optic system, which also have to be very, very stable. So all that takes quite a bit of space. So when we demonstrate an INQ computer, it actually looks not like this chamber, right? It's actually, you know, the design we have right now is like seven several rocks. So it's pretty big. But behind the scenes, that's what's actually happening. So in the uh, in this chamber, uh, we have uh, actually two uh, electromagnetic fields. One is constant, uh, just to kind of with Coulomb push the atoms together in one chain, and uh, electromagnetic field switching, well, changing one, uh, which kind of keeps it with this quadruple moment in the potential gap, keeping all those ions there. So. If you've seen any marketing material, <laughs> you would probably recognize this all-to-all -all connectivity, right? And that's specific for uh, Fortlib, where we had 21 algorithm qubits. What we were kind of, what marketing wanted to show with this slide is that uh, you simply can engage or entangle any of the qubits in your chain, and you do not pay any penalty for it. Right, compared to, let's say, superconducting implementation where you simply need to kind of get your qubits some, some locally, right? some locality for those interactions and then uh, entangle them. Uh, we actually have ability to interact with them absolutely kind of without changing or kind of moving the ions around. So let's talk about native gates. Uh, before I uh, go into physics, uh, the whole process kind of what's what's happening right now when you're submitting high level programming code, right, or circuit, uh, it's actually translated into native codes. There are several compilation and optimization steps. So, for example, um, I believe devising sharpening, well, sharpening is happening there, but like devising will happen on that stage. 
but then in native Git representation, and as I mentioned, it's only um, three, yeah, three physical uh, gates and one virtual. Uh, so RZ, rotation RZ is actually a virtual one. We just basically keep track of phase change, right? But uh, MS gate, it's the uh, gate which entangles two qubits. And then GPI and GPI2, that's the only uh, you know, interactions we have uh, to our ions with lasers. So we're changing the pulse, and I will explain a little bit more what does it mean, uh, changing the pulse representation. The code is executed on uh, GPUs, and you're doing it multiple times, right? And uh, the amount, how many times you run it, uh, you define it as number of shots. That's where you're basically collecting your distribution of the answers, right? And depending on the algorithm, if you expect only a single answer, you're probably going to see peak at one location, and then a little bit of quantum noise around. Right. But the biasing and sharpening, that's the techniques which are supposed to even get rid of those a little bit of noisy answers. Finally, you got the results, right? So physically, we have all our ions actually in line, right? And when this uh, image I was showing you that you have all-to-all -all connectivity, it just basically means that we can take one laser beam, split it, and very accurately address individual ions. So it means that we can easily point even to the ions, let's say, at the, at the ends, although we usually don't do that because those are uh, usually change, uh, kind of losing their quantum state quite easily, right? So instead, we're just using them to squeeze with the uh, constant uh, electric field with Coleman fraction, squeeze the chain kind of to keep all of the rest of the ions together. And when we're talking about uh, algorithmic qubits like 25 AQs, right, or 35 AQs, it's actually how many useful ions you have in the chain, how many useful ions we're using, but physically there will be more of them, but some of them will be using for additional purposes like cooling, pushing uh, this whole chain together, and so on and so forth. All right. So I mentioned that we have only three interactions. Uh, basically, that's your a single uh, qubit rotation, uh, which you can, tr can control by two things. The duration of the photonic package will simply uh, change how much you're going to rotate, right? Uh, your spin, and then the phase, so basically, you kind of where, what was the uh, original phase will dictate the orientation around which axis we actually do in the rotation. And for the two qubit uh, entanglement, uh, so basically, when we kind of choosing two ions, right, and shining on them, um, it's actually interesting that um, kind of you almost creating, uh, it's going to be a little bit of oversimplification, but that's how I visualize it in my mind. It's going to stand in wave. You're basically introducing additional energy component in the Hamiltonian, right? And then uh, basically uh, your ions start sharing the same quantum state. So that's, once again, I apologize, it's oversimplification, but kinda, that's how I visualize it in my mind. Uh, and yes, for our MS gate, it's uh, Molson Sorensen gate. Um, so pretty much like all other gates, Hadamard, C0, it's all expressed through those three, plus this virtual uh, RZ, so rotation around Z, which we just simply, as I mentioned, compiler is just keeping track because like uh, the Z phase is just changing all the time, but you can simply uh, calculate how much time do you need to wait before the next physical interaction with a particular ion to simply keep track what's the current phase uh, or gonna our phase. So if you prefer, um, just tensor representation of the gates. <laughs> That's your tensors. I can probably move this one a little bit. Here we go. And yeah, then basically uh, all the other gates are expressed through this uh, GPI, GPI2, virtual RZ, and MS gate. Uh, if you want to, if you're interested, um, I would say kind of native gates, uh, that's kind of advanced topic. And not that many people even need to use them. So if you just starting GISKIT, CIRC, just go there. 
Uh, with the native gates, it's more if you're interested in uh, compiler optimization or maybe even pulse optimizations, although we do not give public access to that, but eventually we might, we'll see. So native gates is probably, that's where you kind of want to, or work, for example, on measuring fidelity of particular gates, right? That's where native gates are going to be used. And that's a really good starting point for that. All right, example, yeah, native gates can, can be even used in Qiskit. Uh, I got just a little bit of code samples here, right? So for that, you just need to uh, use Qiskit IonQ, import those gates, and that's going to be already available for you. Same goes for circ. We got native gates in circ as well. And Spencer, if you find any bug, <laughs> please send me new screenshots. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, so now the bison is sharpening. So as I mentioned, it's not a error correction technique, it's an error mitigation technique. And uh, if you, for example, take a look at the uh, Amazon bracket, uh, it's basically, uh, this screenshot is a little bit outdated, maybe like a month outdated. Uh, but we have a couple of devices already available, Harmony, Aria, Aria 2, and also if you, uh, Forty is available through um, Amazon Bracket as well, and you can basically see that. Oops, I apologize. Uh, we can have this with error mitigation support phrase right here. Right, what does it mean? That is the technique where we simply let's say you submitted uh, some quantum circuit with um, let's say thousand shots, right? So it means that uh, the algorithm is going to be executed a thousand times. So it's just going to be collecting the distribution. What we do with that, we basically uh, split those thousand shots into about roughly 25 variants. And each variant is modified a little bit, mostly kind of symmetrical. So uh, let's say uh, we can change the position of the qubits. Right, so if uh, that was our uh, ion number one was qubit number one, yes, uh, and then kind of ion number three was qubit number two, we can actually switch them, right? And uh, it's now going to be qubit number one and qubit number two, or something like that. So uh, it means that we're changing the positions, we're changing the um, the way how the uh, photonic package is formed as well, uh, but. All of those variants are supposed to produce exactly the same variant, uh, the same result. But if there's any modifications, right, uh, or um, kind of under rotations, or uh, if we were operating too long and our states uh, already started getting decoherent, you might compensate some of those issues. So think about this as almost like systematic error correction. That's how I approach it. And the second technique is plurality voting, which we call sharpening. Now, let me just move this a little bit away. So plurality voting, just basically collecting the results from all of these different variants, but only those who've seen the most gonna be contribute to the result. So if you have, uh, let's say, a little bit of error, some, sometimes you're going to be getting results, right, due to just some quantum error, just because you not seen these results uh, often enough, it will be dropped. And only those where you got the most contributions, right, the most plurality, going to be contributing to you the result. So that actually brings an interesting, how should I put it, um, you cannot use that approach for all uh, quantum algorithms. Some quantum algorithms require you uh, recreation of the distribution, right? And it's not just one single uh, result, but like several of them may, uh, not several of them. I mean, like if you have two or three, it's fine. You can still use the bias and sharpening. But if you prefer, for example, find the minimum of the distribution, like in case of quantum chemistry, that's not the place to apply this sharpening technique, right? Because uh, it will simply <laughs> kind of amplify some of the signals, right? But not create the profile you're looking for. 
All right. So if you're going to be using uh, some of those techniques for your particular applications during the hackathon, just remember that, right? Uh, so not for all the applications, uh, device and sharpening can be applied. Device and can be, sharpening, no. All right. So yeah, we talk about devising. We talk about sharpening. Is just going again through different aggregation strategies and actually plurality voting or just kind of plain statistic aggregation are not the only ones you can use. You can use uh, smartly um, smarter schemas. Uh, for example, kind of simplified error correction can be uh, reproducing the same circuit twice, and if you're getting different results, you just basically getting rid of that. Something like that. Uh, and it's actually showing pretty good results. So uh, a little bit of co uh, code samples once again, how to use uh, or initiate error mitigation and um, sharpening in uh, Qiskit and Circ. Uh, and, oh, if you want to take a picture. All right, a little bit of a bracket sample. So yeah, it's available pretty much on all of the cloud platform. Uh, I worked uh, with Microsoft to create their notebook where they're showing um, devising and sharpening. So that is actually pretty much it. I would say if you have any um, questions, more questions, you can go to Resource Center and find more uh, kind of intro documentation about this. And uh, yeah, put the brackets um, sample here because yeah, it was uh, basically demonstrating the um, device in shop there. All right, so I think we good on time. If you have any questions, uh, I think it's a good time to ask them right now. Yes. So uh, based on unitary fund last survey, and uh, the trend is there, and it's been there for a couple of years already, uh, Kiskit, although it was pretty much like one of the first programming languages uh, created by IBM, it's still uh, one of the most popular ones. Uh, don't quote me on that, but like I think the percentage wise, it's almost like 65, 70% people using it. Uh, it's a good language, uh, but a lot of kind of IBM hardware leaking into the language, if it makes sense. So uh, it's introduced something, and uh, Spencer is probably going to be, uh, can better kind of tell you about the specifics of that nuances. Uh, but the language is designed for IBM architecture, basically. Right, and if you're trying to apply it to any other architecture, you might experience some kind of those issues. Circ was created by Google with uh, a little bit later, a couple of years later, with slightly more modern and abstract approach to all the hardware. So, and once again, can I, I, I'm speculating here and it's my personal preference, but Circ is something I would usually recommend. Uh, but then for the more high level applications, uh, Penny Lane, like, Xanadu, for example, can be used uh, for um, quantum chemistry applications, quantum machine learning, and it's uh, pretty much like a library of already pre-built algorithms, so to speak, right? And uh, if you don't want to go too deep, maybe pain lane is the way to start, right? And get familiar a little bit more there and then decide, okay, maybe I'm ready to, I don't know, implement my own algorithm. And then you can switch to like Sir Kiskit or maybe go with native gates, who knows, like depending on the problem. And yeah, pick your swagger. Sorry, I'm getting a bit loud. Um, can I also ask about like Q-sharp and like where oh, that yeah. falls in the mix? Um, because I think the class is loaded for that before as well. So Q-sharp, my personal opinion, it's uh, amazingly design language for 25 years from now. So like it's so verbose, it's so got a lot of things they planned for, even uh, for the hybrid programming. Uh, it's got the right parts and pieces, but um, actually one of the creators uh, working at INQ right now, uh, I'm gonna get them from Microsoft. Uh, so yeah, language is perfect, but like too verbose. And if you find with uh, almost like a Java style programming where you need to de declare 
the whole kind of boiling plate first and then kind of do just one git rotation. Sure. <laughs> I mean, Q-sharp can be used for that, but like, um, yeah, everything depends on the problem you're trying to address. And yeah, in my opinion, Q-sharp is, uh, if you're doing something massive, which we, it seems like we're not mature enough as the whole industry to do that. But yeah, sure, it, it, it might be uh, good to use or kind of prepare for that uh, to be ready for the industry really growth and future. And you have your Sure. Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, what is the uh, benefit of using the Hyperion ions for your test? Heavy. <laughs> Plus, uh, uh, there are several contributors. Uh, so the particular energy levels, which uh, aligns with industry grade laser systems, uh, and uterbium is not the only and kind of unique material. We're considering others as well. Uh, but in the previous systems, uh, uterbium and experiments with uterbium showed pretty good stability, gate fidelity, uh, and from the operational wise perspective it was kind of easier to engage with those particular atoms. So we kind of stick with those, but we also considering others. You want to yeah, add something? Just to also add something, a lot of the ions that will choose have very few valence electrons. So this will save, also it takes not a lot of energy to knock off one of the electrons and yeah. then you can use that energy. Again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's kind of the most obvious reason why we use Euterbium because yeah, it's got only, uh, is it like two electrons on the like outer? Acid, you knock off one of the other. Yeah. You knock one out, you got perfect, uh, perfect ion with a single electron on the outer orbital. So that's another. Did you get your spike already or? All right. Yes. Just having a hard Go. time following all of this data. I'm very new to quantum computing. <laughs> so what's no, the sorry. fastest way for me to like get up to speed on how to use these gates and start playing with it? How to use gates. Okay. Uh just from the application. So do you have already problem in mind you're trying to approach with a quantum computer or you don't? If you don't and just want to do that for general curiosity and just want to know more about gates uh i would say all right so there is a kiss kit no book textbook sorry uh which basically gives you pretty much like interactive environment uh, which you can use to kind of experiment play around with the gates uh they have kind of similar thing for uh penny lane by xanadu um there is what else I did like uh, ah there is black opal certification but like uh, it, it's pretty much like zero coding involved but like it, it just talks a little bit more in a uh, very simplified way about quantum computing how to understand entang entanglement superposition and so on and so forth uh, and actually Q sharp uh, there is uh, Q sharp which I'm not sure uh, if they've been already translated to other quantum languages, uh, but it's called okay, quantum katas. Uh, Maria, uh, we used to work together. She basically come up with those uh, challenges for students, uh, which basically ask you to get to a particular quantum state or kind of solve a particular problem. And like it basically uh, becomes a, a open source social project at this point. So people coming up with uh, interesting kind of problems to solve and then also publish these solutions as well. So if you stuck anywhere, you can go and check kind of how others solved it. So uh, if you just want your hands dirty and start with coding something and learn a little bit more about uh, kind of practical coding, I think, um, yeah, uh, quantum code is going to be the good starting point. Yeah. All right. Yes. Like um specifically for like lasers for like the uh, two gate like the, the two cubic gates yeah how does um how does like fidelity how is fidelity affected by the fact as you go further and further apart I guess or, you know you create, create um <laughs> two cubic gate on like these two you know kind of scales or like how does how does that like, happen right right uh so uh I would say the chain is pretty small. Right, so uh, it's not a huge difference. Can I? You go in one meter that way, five feet that way. Uh, so 
there's still differences. And that's why uh, we're doing collaboration for the gates and basically estimating if there's uh, two gate interactions, kind of how to compensate to actually get the state entangled and increase the fidelity. So that's why we actually have all that compiler stuff behind the scenes actually working on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. I like the eye of that, but I know it's just like a, a straight line. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. uh, has, has there been work done with like a two dimensional eye of that? Like a one dimensional eye of that? Uh, that's actually what Daiwei was mentioning. Uh, so it is uh, something we considering multi-core quantum implementation, where basically you're operating on a chain, and then I don't know, move it this side or somewhere else. So kind of uh, you can probably connect two chains together, dangle them, work on different. So yes, uh, it's definitely uh, considered. Uh, there are other implementations. So to address that particular problem, a continuum, for example, operating on very small entanglement angle, so uh, they have to kind of expose the ions, right, to that window to address them. Uh, but because of that, they kind of losing all to all connectivity. So you're basically getting into this situation similar to superconducting, where you kind of almost like need to do swapping or kind of propagate the quantum state to get kind of two ions uh, entangled, which are sitting far apart from each other, all right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I guess the question is, does the eye be one? No, it doesn't. You can't have like a three D surface and a cat board. You can have a three D crystal. But if you think about it, if you have a three D crystal, how are you going to use your laser to constantly detect one eye in the same spot? But then if you have a three D crystal, the thing is the fiber is in very complicated. Mm -hmm. So usually, if you have a much bigger circuit, you kind of choose the simplest system one or system one to two. So if it's related to the first system, how does the day, how does the system to be treated at the state of that system? In principle, because the product of ion share the same thing, so it doesn't matter, they can all talk to each other. In physics, uh, in practice, you can think that what would happen if you subtract from the rate, Water here, how would the motion structure go further and further? So the tsunami cut uh dispersion that the wave packet becomes like broad, right? And if you think this wave packet is what carries this information, actually it is when you entangle them in motion, the wave packet is the same. Now if the line is further apart, this circuit when you reach other lines, it becomes broad. That's what it comes from the case of and if we talk about the uh, you know, if you have this multi section tree to the section to having more ions in the top region to make sure that the ions are not too far. Oh, so many questions. Uh, all right, before I forget, uh, and we will return back to questions. Uh, so I think you really want to take a look into INQ in person uh challenge uh which you're gonna know more about tomorrow because for the first uh prize winners uh we plan to give out steam 512 gigabytes decks all at once so <laughs> yeah so i'm just saying all right so uh there was a question yeah um just follow up on um, also have you guys thought of like, I don't know how it works, but have you guys thought of reflecting the laser and giving it to another ion? Like you hit one ion and then reflect it to another ion. Does it work like that? Or is that going to be useful? Instead of having two lasers. Uh, we still kind of operating, it's going to a uh, single source which then uh, it's called like uh, op, no, acoustic optical modulator or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it be, the problem is you will want to deliver your two packages with the same phase. And now if you put the uh, mirror or something, so you introducing vibration of the mirror to the system, right? That already might screw up the phase. Uh, you also 
cannot guarantee what's the distance. We're gonna distance to an, uh, another ion. So you can, ooh, it might get actually super complicated. It is possible, but yeah, I guess with the mirrors, and also kind of, you will need to control the mirror and uh, with this uh, optoacoustical things, so it's basically changing the voltage on the crystal, and that uh, changes the optical properties of it to uh, split the uh, split the beam. Um, but with later uh, with uh, just rotating mirror, oh, that's going to be probably too difficult to implement, so that it will work accurately. And once again, kind of, I'm not experimental physicist, but <laughs> well, that's how I, yeah, I envision. It's kind of the first problem which kind of pops in mind when you think about it. All right. Well, can I? No. <laughs> Let's try. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Let's start. Yes. Um, I just want to bring you one question. I don't know if you mentioned this in the talk, but um, I was just wondering if I've never used uh, like run anything on the ion mm -hmm. processor. Yeah. Is the best way to do that through the AWS bucket, or I heard you guys have like a new cloud mm -hmm. um, as well? <laughs> we do, and probably. It's going to be easier just to show you quickly. Uh, I think Spencer was showing it as well. So uh, basically, if you go to INQ, uh, I think it's cloud, cloud, INQ.com. Uh, and on the website, there is also a link uh, to get free access to simulator. So uh, through that link, you can just simply register and you will get to the cloud, right? And then simply you can generate the uh, API key by going to your profile let me just move us away so under the profile right here if you go to api keys you can generate one so let's say mit key it will simply show you once uh you can save it but it's not going to be visible after that uh for the security purposes, if somebody gonna get access to your uh, web interface, at least they're not gonna be able to retrieve the keys. Uh, but basically, yeah, using this key, then you can simply follow any example in the resource center um, to submit the job using that key. So I think that's how simple it is. Let me revoke it. <laughs> Here we go. So that's how you do it. And then... Okay, there was another question. Yeah, so earlier you mentioned that you rotate the light more energy so like it's an ion. Wouldn't that impose like a small like phase onto the ion yeah. to like the Yep, yep, yep. So you mitigate that you can like spike the rotation. Yep. So you can sort of like okay, every ten seconds like speed. How much of the laser is that in this? Oh speed of light? I mean what they full duration. Ah, full duration. Uh, oh, oh man, I'm not an experimental yeah. physicist. Hmm? Picoseconds. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure even about the order. So picoseconds. We actually okay. So um, with ultraviolet, um, instead of a visible spectrum you can get uh, significantly faster gains. Problem with ultraviolet, it actually burns down your fiber optics. So cool, yeah, you can have your gates, but the problem is like two weeks later, you have to you know, get rid of your quantum machine because like it's not virtual anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the you kind of two cents. I guess a follow-up, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, are you like also researching materials that could maybe go higher? Uh, we do have pretty big research and development team and they yeah going all over in different. So it's not only uh, new materials, it's also about optics implementation, optics interconnect. So like, yeah, I mean like uh, pretty much big chunks of the company is still in this experiment uh, experimentation stage, but we hiring um, this new office in Seattle area. They're gonna be focusing on industrialization meaning that we want to build quantum computers, which are gonna be very similar to each other and uh, simply be modular as well. 
mean if something goes wrong with the laser, pull the block out, put the new one, you got your running computer again. So that's the plan. But yeah, I answer your first part of the question. We doing quite a bit of research as well. And I believe that's the last one. But we still got t-shirts. Yes. So um earlier you mentioned like the yeah. mm -hmm. Um so I was wondering like because I have been thinking about like like quantum even quantum aircraft and closing physics to that kind of architecture. Because I know that like a lot of them rely on like local connectivity and things like that. Yeah. So uh of course it is we're thinking about it <laughs> to answer simply uh but we do not have enough ions. So uh, from one perspective, yeah, we can experiment. We can probably even implement one good logical qubit. And then what do you do with it? Without optical interconnect, without anything. So yeah. So to answer your, your question, yes, we are thinking about it, but like it's a little bit longer on the roadmap when we will have a couple of other components implement first. And well, that's a teacher. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, uh, we I believe pretty much like on time, and I got still tons of t-shirts and beanies. So feel free just to stop by and grab one if you want. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right.